I'm coming back in your lifetime. So it's not long before he comes back. So we need to be ready. We don't like to be like the five virgin brides that ran out of oil in our lamps. We need to be like the bride that could, full of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus wants a bride for himself that's pure, sanctified and holy. And one of the things, you know, in these days here, we say, how can we do that? There's so much trouble going on around the world today. Am I going to lose my home because the interest rates are going up? All this kind of worries are facing us. And I wanted to talk to you about this kind of thing. And I want to help you to get through this, to get on top of this. So I'm going to open up with, what is it, Luke 16. And I'm going to share with you a topic of one word. And I will reveal that word later after I share this passage with you. From Luke 16, from verse 1. And I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. This is the parable of the unjust steward. He also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward. And an accusation sorry, was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said to him within himself, Oh, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do that when I am put out of stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. So the master commended, what? The master commended the young unjust steward because he has dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. What is this shrewdness? What was his thinking? Now what's interesting that his master was a rich man. Now the rich people, they have one characteristic. They know how to make money out of what belongs to other people. Bank, for example. So you put your money into them, oh yes, we'll give you 2% interest. They lend it to somebody else, yes, you pay me 10% interest. So what happens? They make 8% profit. All right? The one word there is leveraging. Leveraging. Lever. You know, when you've got a rock, you want to push, you can't do it with your own effort. So you need to get something else to help you do it, like a crowbar, on a smaller rock and you put the crowbar on it and uh, you get the rock out that way. Leveraging. It's scriptural. It's all through scriptures. But we don't realise it because that word is never used per se as such. That's the difference between the people who are on salary, wages, who, don't, who cannot get out of the rut that they're in, into thinking like these rich people. Because, I mean, a lot of them were school failures. University dropouts. 
but they knew there was, uh, the secret secret to the whole power, the whole making money is leveraging. And Jesus wants to do that out from the kingdom point of view. So I'm going to share with you some, some keys about that. All right? So you understand what I mean by leveraging? You're using what belongs to somebody else to get what you need or what you want. The aim of leveraging is that the maximum effort be made by the others, others with minimum effort to yourself, like the banks. Give me your money, come on. I'll lend it to you. Oh, I hate this That's why this guy was very shrewd. He was leveraging. He was applying the secret of his master's richness. His master recognised it. He recognised, oh, this guy's smart. He knows the secret about how we make money. By leveraging. That guy was making deals with all these people. Listen, if you cut this bill down, I'll be your friend. He was leveraging them for friendship. He was leveraging them for favours. He was leveraging them to get what he needed in case he lost his stewardship. He didn't want to go out begging. He didn't want to go out digging streets. He wanted a good life. And the key, the whole thing there is leveraging. So let's have a look at some examples in the Bible about leveraging. The be- one of the best ones is in... Um, just a minute. Just go back to... Here we are. The story of the um, widow in 2 Kings chapter 4. In the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. A certain woman of the wives of the son of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to him, What? said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbours, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then poured it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her son who brought the vessel to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go, sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your son shall live on the rest. There's a lot of leveraging going on in there, when you think about it. She leveraged what she possessed. A little jar of oil. Put that in the in the in the business. She leveraged what she knew. She knew she had neighbours. She knew her people all around her. She knew Elisha. That helped. She leveraged what she knew. She knew that she needed to send her sons out to do the work for her. She leveraged her sons to go out to everybody in the whole village to get every single vessel they can get their hands on. She was still at home. So 
So she left it who she knew. She leveraged her optical opportunities. She didn't look at that small jar. She looked at that man of God. She just leveraged what he said for herself. Somebody had said the word to her. I'm going to take that word for myself. Okay? And so she... No. Another one, but dealing with optical from the New Testament... Remember Jesus fed 4,000. And uh, where am I? Yeah, feed 44,000, Matthew 15, verses 32 to 38. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And his disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven loaves and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks and broke them and gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled and they took up seven large baskets full of fragments that were left. Now those who ate were 4,000 men beside women and children. That's a lot of people. When you count the men, women and children, 4,000 men, maybe 3,000 women and 2,000 kids, maybe 10,000 and all. But just seven loaves. So there were two leveraging that he was doing. And this is the key, the principle of leveraging in, in, for our situation. One, like the woman with the little oil, he said, what do we have? He didn't have it. Somebody else had it. So he, the disciple brought in the seven loaves and a few little fish. And the second part of leveraging was he leveraged the word of God. He blessed the bread. Now why I like using that word leveraging because sometimes we struggle to believe for abundant life. Jesus said, I have come to give you life. Life more abundant. More abundant than what you're in right now. And, uh, I mean, we pray, oh, Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, in heaven we've got street paved with gold. We've got mansions. Right? And we say, Father, that's his will for us in heaven. That we live in mansions and walk around in gold paved streets. And, it, and our prayer is the fact that your, your kingdom come right here. Your will be done right here. Hallelujah. God wants nothing but the best for us. And what we need to do as shrewd believers is to learn the art of leveraging the word. All right? Sometimes we need two levers, one like Jesus had with the fish. And um, so they were leveraging in the physical and in the spiritual. You need both. So, why I like you using the word leveraging? Sometimes, you know, when you've got a great big rock, okay, when it's sitting on there, you can lever it, but sometimes the rock is buried. And you've got to get that rock out no matter what. So you keep leveraging. You keep finding up a new way of leveraging this particular obstacle until you get it out. So in the same way we need to, use to, to leverage the word until we know we get the results that we want. We don't give up. We keep at it. Applying the word of God into that situation. Knowing his scriptures. 
So this is one of the key things that we need to do is to position ourselves properly. Because one thing I commonly hear from believers is, oh, we don't have enough. We never have enough. What you say is what you believe, and that's what happens. If you say we don't have enough, you will never have enough. If you say, oh, we'll never get out of debt, you will never get out of debt. You say what you speak, and what happens? The power of the tongue. Your tongue speaks life and death. So we as believers really need to get into his word. Like I shared with God wants abundant life for us. Super abundant life. With no lack in anything. No lack in health. No lack in finances. No lack in our needs. No matter the situation, what's going on around us. Because of the word. The power of the word. The leveraging power of the word. You might remember the, um, where is it? Oh, here it is. Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, you right there, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And he answered her, Not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then she came to worship, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dog. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs for which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said, O woman, of great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. She knew how to leverage that problem. Okay, there's a little crumb. Oh, she's smart. There are crumbs always spilt. And it was good enough for my dog, good enough for my kids. She leveraged Jesus. She leveraged him until she got what she wanted. She had nothing. All she had for her daughter to be set demon free, all she had was Jesus. He's your lever. You've got any problems? You're struggling with finances? What not? Take it to Jesus. Thirteen years ago, I had a lot of debt. A lot of debt. I owed money on the house. I owed money on a nice big boat that I had. A few other things. And I heard the Lord say to me, get out of debt. I said, <clears throat> how am I going to do that? So, the Lord said, I just prayed about it. And, the Lord, and I felt that I needed to sell the boat. Because the boat was really a bad debt. When you buy a boat and buy money on the boat, not only are you paying interest on the money, but the value of the boat is going down. Not like a house where you normally expect the house value to be going up. So, I went and sold the boat. But the problem was, I kept the boat at Bateman Bay. Nobody wanted to buy boats down there. They had no boat been sailed for years down there. And, and um, so I knew I had to take it up to Sydney, up north of Sydney, to where I bought the boat. Two days trip away. So I said, well, I'm going to have to take the boat up there. But at that time, it was stormy weather. 
So I hired a couple of guys to come with me to take the boat up. And boy, did we have a rough trip. I have never had a rough trip in my life. Oh, man. Because the, it's a strong, easily wind. Especially when you come past up the coast with the cliffs. The waves hit the cliff and then bounce back. So as we were travelling, we had waves coming in from two directions. From the east and from the west. And sometimes when the waves meet up together, the boat goes right up and come crashing down. Oh man, it was scary. But we got to pit water. And the guy there says, and the old friend there said, well, you know, um, it usually takes about 18 months for us to sell the boat. I'll see what I can do for you. I said, Lord, you told me to sell the boat. I expect that boat to be sold ASAP. It was sold 18 days later. <laughs> so you start something that the Lord instructs you to do, he will bless you for it. And really, if you start, if you have a debt and you're trying to get out of it, don't look at the bigness of the debt. Look at the bigness of God. God is far bigger than all your debts. And so, when I got the money, I was able to rearrange all my finances. Now, one of the thing, key things about debt, getting out of debt, get some good financial advice. Get a financial counsellor to help you through it, to plan your way through it. That's what I did. I was blessed with a business partner who was also my accountant. And once I sold that boat off and got that lot of debt out, then he helped me restructure the whole business so that we were all, I was completely out of debt within a few months. It was over half a million. Over half a million. The debt of the house was paid off everything. just by restructuring. But God accelerated. God showed a way. God provided a way. And uh, because I received an inheritance and that helped. But, you know, I'm, it, sometimes you're struggling, oh, how am I going to get it? Get on the YouTube. There are testimonies of people who had miracles of getting out of debt. And you know what the testimony, word, the testimony means? Do it again. If you can do it for this person, I want you to do it for me. Do it again. Stand on the testimony. Stand on his word. They're your leverage. That's just how you can get things, and God will just move on your behalf because you're shrewd, you're wise, you're clever. Hallelujah. I mean, if God did this for me, he can do it for you. No matter how big, no matter how small, God wants you to have a life more abundant than what you're having now. And I'm just hoping I can help you guys with getting hold of a key it's a powerful key. It's a key that when in used in this wo world, men get very rich because they understand the power of leveraging. So if it's very powerful in the world, how much more powerful it is when it's used for kingdom purposes? Hmm? He who is in us is greater than he who is of the world. We have Jesus. And one of the things, you know, understand, debt, okay, it's not a sin. But it does rob you of your happiness. It does rob you of some peace. It's a thief. And God and desire, there's no debt in heaven. So, so his desire for you is not to have any debt. And, uh, and like having a look at some of the statistics in, around the, in America, around Australia, the number of believers who are struggling with debt is not funny. It's not funny. So my prayer is the fact that you go home and you start praying to God, now how can I leverage my way out of this situation? Give me the word that I need to use as levers. Give me some scriptures. Stand on those scriptures. Use them like levers, never giving up on those scriptures until they come to pass. His words never return to him empty. His word always comes down to do what it does. His word never fails. So, Heavenly Father, um, I should just get ready with the communion.
please. I'll start with the communion chairing now while, while people hand out the communion. You know, one of the wonderful things about the blood of Jesus is it cleanses our hearts, cleanses our mind, cleanses our conscience, cleanses us all from dead works so that we can serve the true living God in all areas of our lives. Jesus died not so that we would live in poverty. Jesus died so that we, we could live an abundant life. He became cursed for us so that we could have every spiritual blessing in him. In him is all our need met. Now you know that God created you with a destiny, with a purpose. Now one of the things that he, that he did was to make sure there was every provision in heaven available for you to achieve your destiny. All right? God had, if God called you out to do something, he doesn't call you out and leave you with nothing to work with. He gives you all the resources that you need to fulfill your calling on your life. And uh, Jesus paid a big price for you. Oh, thanks. Bless you. And um, he became cursed for you. By his stripes we were healed. He took all the punishment for us. He was bruised, wounded, died, tortured, beyond recognition, all for us, so that we could live. He said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. He is the way to the Father. He is the way to heaven. And, and you know, all the blessings are in him. I was sharing with Jordan last week. I said, look, I'm not a big fan of this open heaven business in Malachi, because that's the Old Testament. Because in the New Testament, how can we be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus if the heaven is not open to us? We have an open heaven for us. Every spiritual blessing that we need is in Jesus. We don't need to go wait for the... We receive it by faith from Jesus. And I'll give you another thought while I think of it. It's not about money. It's not about money because there's no money in heaven. But it's about home. It's about whatever you, physical things you need. But money is not something you have in heaven. So that's why the woman gets oil. She doesn't get money. He just said, yeah, but you need, you need the money to get that. Go and sell the oil. I've given you all the oil that you need to get the money that you need to get, get your son's debt paid off. All right? So it, it, when you're praying and blaming for things, yes, you can pray for your debt to be cancelled. And that's what I'm praying for now. So, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the wonderful blessings you have poured out for us through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus. That you have poured every curse into him so that we could be completely set free and live in the life abundant that Jesus had declared for us. We thank you for the body that he gave his body for us. He took all our punishment. We take this bread in remembrance of him, what he's done for us on that cross. And remember, he poured out his blood for us. Every last drop of it. Every last drop of it. And there's even sprinkling of blood in heaven for us. Nothing's in Hebrews. Because the Father always sees us through his Son. So I thank you, Father, for the covenant that you made with us. 
for the forgiveness of sins that we have in the blood. And I thank you, Father, that if we take this blood, we know that we are forgiven of all our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. And Heavenly Father, I just declare and decree that every heart in here be, and every mind in here be moved into action. That we don't just sit here and say, oh, this is the great message. That we be moved by your Holy Spirit to act, to start leveraging the Word of God, to start leveraging, to bring whatever we need, to even take a can dead card with my phone. My phone, dead card in the phone. So I declare and decree that cancellation of all debt in Jesus' name. And I speak cancellation of all debt in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, for the promise that you have given us, a promise of abundant life, of a life more abundant than what we're living now. Father, I just pray that this happened because you have called us to be your witnesses. And we need to be your witnesses in this, in this sick world where people say, how? How can you survive in this situation? How is it that you're laughing and happy despite all the interest rate inflation going up? Because of Jesus. Father, I just pray that they have a revelation of Jesus, that they become more willing to share who Jesus is because of what he does for them. The cancellation of debts everywhere, the restoration of health, and all these things, Father. Help us, remind us through your Holy Spirit to stand on your word to give us the scripture that we need to stand on to, for things to come to pass and thank you Father for your strength thank you Father for your Holy Spirit thank you Father for your Son Jesus thank you for your word thank you for the blood thank you for the authority that we have in Jesus name Amen <laughs>